Hi, everybody, again, thank you for joining us today and welcome to today's program. Today's program is uh, Defining a Path to the Digital Enterprise, Strategies for Accelerating Workplace Evolution. Uh, I'm Odalis. Dallas, I'm with BDI, the event organizer uh, to today's program, and we are event partner to Tata Communications, the sponsor of the program. Um, but now I want to go to our, our poll question. I just dropped a link in the Zoom chat if everybody could Go ahead and click on that. It will prompt you to uh, type in your first name and I'll go ahead and share my screen and we can uh, answer some book questions here. So I'll give everybody a minute to join that. And then, okay, so for our first question today, I have a bunch of Zoom windows here. Okay, our first question. Um, today's session will focus on strategies, people, processes, and assets that are critical for success in the way we work. Uh, what's your biggest priority? Uh, the first option is access for hybrid users. Second option, network stability, security, and agility. Third, cost, or fourth, all of the above. So if you could just take a moment and select your answer, and we'll see the results come in. Oh, we got Okay. All of the above is what I was expecting too. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. That kind of feels like the easy out. Um, <laughs> That's true. So, so personally, from my perspective, because we've been very busy with return to office activities. And if we don't focus our attention on making the end users as productive in the office, as they were working from home for the last 18 months, then the amount of enrollment and interest in return to office will certainly start to wane. So focusing on uh, really comforts of in the office, similar to what was had in the home, you know, more flexible working hours, um, the ability to work anywhere in the office, right? So you're you know, easier access, better Wi-Fi connectivity. Um, and, and now that we've all moved towards uh, collaboration, you know, voice, video and whatnot on our, on our machines, no more hard phones. That makes you know, having those conversations and setting up calls that much easier uh, without locking down to a single desk. No, that's fantastic. When I worked in the Defense Department and uh, did acquisitions in intelligence and defense, uh, you're, you're trained as an acquisition professional uh, to trade off three factors in selections of uh, a proposal of who's going to execute the program. Those three factors are cost, performance, and schedule. And you can pick any two, but it's hard to get all three optimized. Yeah. And, uh, and in this case, uh, you would ask, well, what about security? How does that fit in with cost, performance, and schedule? And the answer is, you pick the best security you can. The mission is too critical to give up anything in security, and then you trade off cost, performance, and schedule. But select security first. And I think in this case, you're talking about stability, security, and agility. If you don't have that in your network, you're at risk, particularly today, in the case of ransomware and the needs for your people and your data to be protected just as equally for privacy oh. and security. Yeah, I, I like the way you think, Tom, that's for sure. Uh, if, if you don't mind, can I ask, based on these three, if you were to prioritize the words, I know security was up there with you, you Tommy. Um, I know with my clients, a lot of the, the first thing they want to talk about is cost. Then it goes network stability, and then it goes access for hybrid users. What would be your prioritization? Would you start with security, network security? Yeah, I would definitely start with security. Yeah. Cost is important. I mean, you can't ignore cost. But, sure. uh, but in, in the, the way that I think, and, and maybe it's from my military and intelligence background, is you've got to go find the best security on the market. Uh, you can negotiate costs, you can drive costs through scale or volume, uh, but to get second best cybersecurity is opening yourself up to risk and threats that are unnecessary. Uh, yep. and, and so if you think that way, 
you'll find out that cost is secondary to having the best security. Uh, now, other business, a small business specifically, they're operating on small margins. They're just trying to make payroll every week. Then mm. cost may be a bigger factor. And uh, I've had the fortune of working for big companies and I'm not experienced it in that, but, uh, uh, but you're working with other people and your security puts other corporations at risk. But so if Tommy, you're, don't, you're, you, don't, don't you also find that um, in those small companies, because they focus on cost first, will be the ones that are most um, easiest uh, pickings Absolutely. For, mm -hmm. for ransomware, for security vulnerabilities. Yeah. So, so from, from my perspective, um, if you don't consider security before cost, whatever you save by going with a um, cheaper platform, you go cheap, you get cheap, is more likely to leave you susceptible to something that will cost far more, like a ransomware encryption of all of your data because you didn't invest in immutable backups or air gapping any part of your infrastructure. Um, and, and those are the kinds of things that it's very important to take into account in these types of strategies. Yeah, I, I've had, yeah. The, uh, I had the good fortune of working with big companies, but when you're looking at, at game theory and a game theoretical approach, what I found out last week at the Black Hat conference is the, the threat, the advanced persistent threat, whether they're criminal actors or state-sponsored actors, they know the type of insurance you have for cyber insurance. Yep. Small, small businesses tend to just take the risk. Uh, larger businesses, they get insurance because that's the corporate responsible thing to do. And they know exactly how much insurance you have. So when the ransomware request comes in, voila, surprisingly, it's for the exact amount of insurance you have. They're trying to make it easy for you to pay. And, uh, and so in game theory, what you want to do save costs on your insurance, reduce your insurance costs, and <laughs> use that money to buy better security. Yeah, good, good, good stuff, guys. I'm glad uh, you're, uh, you've already jumped in there, uh, loving <laughs> it, making, this, making my life a lot easier. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I just put up a second question on the screen. Um, so the second question, it says, the next normal has created a new business landscape where digital first strategies are driving employee, partner, and customer interaction. Has this accelerated your transformation strategy? And the options are, yes, we've moved it up by three months. Yes, we've moved it up by six months. Yes, we're delayed and or paused for nine to 12 months or no, it's business as usual. I'm not trying to influence the answer here, but I read a report one time that said it was uh, it was up by six years the uh, the digital transformation acceleration. Uh, I don't know if uh, you guys believe that number or not, but in so certain areas, I've definitely seen like especially move you know to the to the cloud when it comes to like you know customer experience or contact centers or cloud communications. Um, any any thoughts on that? So yeah, I'll, I'll about, say, I'm oh, sorry. sorry, go ahead. Sorry about that. You talking about the McKinsey report or something like that? They said like five, yes, I, five I think years in like eight weeks or something like that. Yeah, 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 exactly. Something like that, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think they were referring mostly to the, uh, the, the uh, you know, the user experience uh, mm -hmm. and, and particularly, you know, as, as workers went remote. Um, I wonder, I wonder what, um, what some of the folks on here are, are from, you know, the cloud application uh, uh, side of the house and accelerating the adoption and migration to the cloud. Are you, you guys, uh, Chad, I think it was, it was you, if I remember correctly, any thoughts on that? Yeah, you know, I think, I don't know if like the pandemic or anything has caused us to accelerate. Um, I think there's a, you know, certainly in all the other aspects of the business, I mean, Jamie Dimon didn't even have a work at home policy until, um, you know, this whole hit. So certainly from like an employee and people perspective, absolutely. But from a cloud acceleration perspective, we've had kind of the foot on the gas for quite some time. Um, I don't feel like it's necessarily been a huge acceleration event, but certainly um, 
if you weren't a believer before, uh, you certainly are now. And it's been driven more, more by kind of data center exit migration strategies than um, any particular event in the world, is my perspective. Yeah. Any, anyone from a customer experience background that, that has any view on that? Well, I've got one comment and a, a follow-up question, if I may, go around. And yeah. I'd, uh, I'd ask it of uh, either Michael or uh, of Tommy. Well, at least with some of the things we've seen with some of our Fortune 500 customers, where, um, and it depends on the segments as well, right? If you're in, in your, I guess, in uh, tool and die, you may not see it as much. But if you're in cosmetics or if you're in any customer-facing thing, what we found is that the pandemic has really been an accelerant for a number of organizations to really kind of accentuate or really roll out their digital transformation, right? So you think of a lot of folks that used to come into the office, but they didn't for a year to two years. And you find a lot of folks saying, can we maintain our productivity or improve on it with people working from home? If so, do we really need all that office space? Do we really need all these dentistators located outside? So we're finding a number of folks who are saying, you know what, let's use this opportunity or crisis as a means to accelerate. So let's say collaboration is a great example, right? Where you're saying, wow, everybody's working from home. We really want everybody calling you know, on their mobiles in. What are we doing in terms of either Zoom adoption, Teams adoptions, or collaboration? What do you gentlemen think? What are your thoughts about that in the next six, nine, 12 months in terms of whether the pandemic and the new normal? Is that accelerating from that perspective? Or do you think it's really kind of you know, limited to the segments, right? You know, if you're, if you're Estee Lauder and you're cosmetics and everybody's not going to the malls, you got to find another way. If you're banking, maybe you're not impacted. I mean, those are things I'd love to get your thoughts on. Yeah, I'll, I'll open up with just some, some thoughts on the federal market that I primarily deal with uh, coming out of government and, and working at HP as the CTO of our federal division. Uh, the dollars that have been put out by the Fed to keep the economy rolling has really stimulated our business. And where families uh, were happy with one computer shared by five members of the family are now finding that every member of the family needs a computer just to go to school. Mm -hmm. You can't have three children sharing a computer when each of them has the same class time. Uh, the federal government is putting people work from home, but realizing they need a computer at home and a one at work. And they're doubling the amount of printers and computers that they're buying. And so uh, they've been flying off the shelf and it's really caused us a supply chain issue uh, because uh, we have maybe 10,000 vendors that work for us and assembling and creating and making the parts that go into these machines. And, uh, and, and they're running out. And, uh, and so just getting the supply chain is the focus of most of our executives in the company is trying to get that so we can uh, go from where we used to have stock for three months ready to go. You know, we're, we're putting some of our products off six months just to, before we can get it to a customer. And that's a big impact. And, and what could be a, a very big market is really putting the brakes on and not what we need in our economy right now. So from my perspective in the banking environment and credit and debit. Um, it's been really critical for us because very few of our workers actually need to be in the office, except for those who are in card manufacturing and, and statement printing. But even there, we've had to put in um, social distancing programs. We've also, in the offices where people are doing return to office, we've had to restack most of our locations in order to create an environment where the workers feel more comfortable showing up after 18 months of, of not being, um, let's say in, in kissing distance of each other in, in the tiny honeycomb cubes we were in for so long. And for us, that's made us reassess our wireless coverage. It's made us reassess things like VDI as now the norm for how you connect to or leverage resources but not VDI farms in our data centers, but VDI farms in public cloud. So that this way, wherever the users need those resources, we can make sure that we're in the right region from the right cloud provider so that it can be localized to them. We had call centers with thousands of agents that couldn't work in the call center anymore. 
and all had to be moved to a VDI-like environment working from their homes. So it, we've seen a significant acceleration to digital transformation from an end user perspective and also from a customer perspective. All of our customers now want, you know, they don't want their uh, consumers to have to carry four or five different types of cards or um, carry or even get, you know, statements, but they still want everything done just as securely. So we're also looking and making a big push towards digital enablement on mobile devices, regardless of what type that device type of device that might be. We, yeah, surprisingly, I, I won an Emmy this year. I, I never thought uh, going to HP would uh, allow me to compete for an Emmy award, but uh, uh, we won an Emmy on technology that we created so that the movie industry and the TV industry could do editing at home in a collaborative fashion. So they all didn't have to be in the same room in the same studio, but they could do this from their home office. And it was a, a speed, a transfer and digitization that was allowing people to see the same thing at the same time and make edits to it in real time. And they realized we can stay separate and still produce product. And to the, to the voters that were on the Emmy board, that gave us uh, an Emmy and it was, uh, you know, kind of one of these surprising <laughs> highlights in your career. So. That sounds really cool. Yeah. yeah. Uh, before we continue, I just want to thank you all for being so engaging on that panel. And you've already heard from all of our panelists so much already, but I did want to give them a chance to formally introduce themselves. Um, so, Gaurav, do you want to start? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thank you. Um, I was I was going to jump in too, but it was going so well. I figured that, that's uh, <laughs> so, so good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so thank you, uh, Tommy and Michael, for for that, and uh, look forward to more of this. Uh, so uh, bear with us for a short intermission here. Uh, so I'm Gaurav uh, Anand. I am the Vice President here for our Global Enterprise Solutions here at Tata Communications. Uh, been here uh, just about over two decades uh, and uh, loving every minute of it. Uh, it's an interesting um, times we live in. And uh, I just uh, um, wanted to take this opportunity to thank uh, Mike and Tommy to uh, participate on this panel and share their views. Uh, and on that note, I will pass it on to Tommy to maybe give his uh, introduction. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Gary. I'm, uh, uh, my background was uh, I played football in high school. I got recruited by Steve Belichick to play at the Naval Academy. And uh, his son, Bill Belichick, was my age. So I got uh, taught by some great coaches and uh, ended up doing okay for, for a, uh, a small town athlete to, to get to the academy. I was interested in education. It was outstanding education. The Navy sent me through four graduate programs. And so thanks to Uncle Sam, I am where I am today. The highlight of my Naval career was commanding the USS San Juan, a submarine, nuclear submarine, SSN 751. And probably the top award I won was uh, Governor of Puerto Rico. Uh, when we went down to visit uh, San Juan in Puerto Rico, uh, named me an honorary Puerto Rican. So that was a uh, Quite, uh, so I'm a, a big supporter of Hispanic causes now because I am an honorary Puerto Rican. I uh, went on into industry and have been CTO at four different companies, each one slightly uh, bigger revenue base. And uh, at HP, I, I told the CEO that I burned my resume. I never want to leave. Uh, it's a fantastic company with great people. Uh, most of the senior executives I work with have been there 20 plus years. And so I'm responsible for technology and, uh, and working with customers and understanding the customer needs and getting that in, insight fed back into our product designs. So uh, I'm a doctorate in economics, uh, specifically energy economics uh, and, and having a background in engineering and specifically mechanical and nuclear engineering, and then studying economics was a real eye-opener uh, to see the cost trade-offs that are applied to product development. With that, I guess, thank Michael, you. You, you go next. Sure, uh, thank you, Tommy. Um, not, not nearly the, um, as impressive a background as Tommy has, but um, Michael Winston, Director of Network Architecture for Pfizer, 
uh, one of the world's largest financial services companies, FinTech. My organization is responsible for new technology and new product development. Technologies like network function virtualization, public cloud, data center fabrics, automation, um, containers, all of those fall within my team's uh, purview and we're responsible for identifying trends, identifying um, companies that are up and coming startups so that we can help Pfizer continue to deliver the, the best digital experience, not just for our, um, our merchant customers or our end user customers who use the, our transaction network every day, um, but also our banking and, and a number of um, government institutions that also leverage the Fiserv infrastructure. I've uh, been in infrastructure for uh, most of my career, well, just about 30 years, um, and uh, never want to leave. And, and I dread the day that they tell me it's time for me to retire. <laughs> you know, Michael, when you said Pfizer, I, I, Pfizer, I, I was here in <laughs> Pfizer and no, thinking you were making drugs. all these shots that people are taking. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. We don't make drugs. We make money. <laughs> Although you can use uh, our money. Touche. There you go. <laughs> well, thanks, uh, thanks, uh, thanks, guys. Thanks, Mike and Tommy. So, I, I, let me let me just kick it off uh, with uh, a couple of questions here for you guys. Uh, and, and and I know the some of the conversation here has already been quite enlightening. Uh, some questions that I had in mind, anyway. But um, one of the things I I wanted to kind of go into was. Um, you know, the problem that this new or the next normal is kind of posing for enterprises, right? And at, at different levels. So digital transformation, you know, heavily used word, you know, but technically what it comes down to is it requires, you know, business systems, uh, services, data, applications, APIs, all the processes, they need to be access accessible um, through multiple mechanisms, anywhere, um, any device, uh, any time, right? So essentially the, the access to all of the services that used to be nicely kind of, you know, uh, uh, structured, you know, data centers or, you know, um, perimeter defined um, uh, uh, access mechanisms, um, it, it, that's all kind of gone, uh, you know, uh, like someone's taken a sledgehammer to it, right? Uh, so when it first started, this whole COVID thing, and you know, we, we was it was it was more survival, right? How are we going to make it? Now, as we come back, I think, and some of the stats that I'm reading is that maybe about 48 percent of people in the next normal are going to still be working remote. So when it comes to that, you know, that that's when the CISOs and the you know organizations you start thinking about like, what's our security posture there, right? Because now you're accessing, and you know, it used to be. You know the old security model. Like if you're inside, it means you're trusted, uh, and if you're outside, you're not, and that's not the case anymore. Um, so, what do you what do you guys think? You know, enterprises are doing right now. From we'll start with the access part of it. Uh, uh, in in order to sort of secure, uh, you know, the users from accessing the data. What are some of the tools? What are some of the processes, the strategy, the thinking that the companies are going through in order to sort of kind of create that that new or next normal? You, you brought up a good point here about the perimeterization. If you're on the inside, you're trusted. And that goes against the grain of where we are today right. uh, in a zero trust philosophy or zero trust architecture. If you uh, take a look at NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technologies, and their 800 series, which talks about security uh, for their special publications, uh, the 800 Dash 207 is the one of the newest uh, publications they have on zero trust architecture. And mm -hmm. it gives you the rundown of how this starts in 2004, 2004, and 2009. The term zero trust is articulated by Forrester. And, and this is the kind of uh, architecture you need to reconstruct when you've got half your people working at home. Some industries and some government agencies were well ahead of the curve because they were already uh, for, you know, for personnel reasons. You know, and you live in the Washington, D.C. area, you spend three hours a day on the road. It's a very big drag on productivity. Uh, and now if you can have your employees work at home, you know, 
they're probably putting the same time in, but they're being very much productive instead of just sitting through the third round of national public radio. And uh, uh, so this is something that I think is very important to, to, to take advantage of the home life. It's gonna create a need for more uh, virtual networks, VPNs. Mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, gonna need another NIST document is 800-204 on a uh, virtualization or micro segmentation. And uh, it's gonna drive the need to use that type of technology uh, more to protect the home user who doesn't have the controls that an industry network center has, but protect right. them, not just through the VPN, but their data and protect them from the ransomware or the malicious uh, malware that could be clicked on. And if you can drive your organization and, and be able to support the people at home, usually th there had been barriers between your home equipment and your office equipment. You're not supposed to do office work on your home equipment and home work on your office. You know, they're, they're, and those barriers are starting to fall mm -hmm. and, and they, they almost have to, to be productive. And so that gives the CISO a much bigger problem they have to face. And, right. uh, and there's technology and tools out there. And, and so to answer your direct question, it's an education problem. It's to connect the people and technology together. It needs education of what is available and what's coming down the pike. Uh, most companies need a full-time person just to have a vision, a crystal ball mm -hmm. to see what's coming so they can plan, hey, we're going to expend this much money in another year to put these type of products in. And why is because it's going to reduce our risk and exposure. Right. Michael. Yeah. Thanks, Michael. Oh, hi. Yeah. So, so for for us, it, it's been um, really critical from a security posture standpoint to ensure that when our users are working in the office or at home, as we move also towards more of a BYOD type of environment, just people now are you know more comfortable working on their iPad or on their Chromebook or on their MacBook and, but still having to keep those same security policies. As Tommy mentioned, one of the things that we've been looking at, and I put a link in the chat for those folks who are interested in looking at the NIST website to see what the zero trust architecture actually means. One of the things we've been looking at is putting something like that into place. So that regardless of whether you show up every day at a Starbucks because you've got a really bad coffee habit and that's where you are sitting to work or you're going to one of the few clusters of office locations we're going to keep open, the experience needs to be the same, but it also needs to be a secure experience. So when you look at things like um, how do users authenticate, we can't have users still using passwords. If you make passwords more complex because it's harder to hack, then users are using Notepad or TextEdit or some other little document to, or even worse, you know, putting it on sticky notes. So they save all the passwords, right? So, so moving towards more of a, not single sign-on, but more of a passwordless infrastructure where you use things like multi-factor authentication and educate your users that multi-factor authentication isn't something that's just, you know, that, that isn't meant to annoy them or bother them. Um, it's meant to provide a more secure work environment for your customers. But you also have to make that multi-factor authentication um, less painful, right? So anyone who ever carried an RSA token fob and then showed up someplace, realized they forgot it and then had to go back in order to get where they left their token fob. Now we all have our RSA tokens on our phones or you've got Ping ID or Hyper or any of the other um, passwordless authentication mechanisms. But you also have to make sure that the um, organizations understand things like SMS are not secure for doing your, your, your ability to do multi-factor authentication because those are the types of things that are easily targeted, you know, by somebody just jacking your SIM card or 
showing up to a Verizon store and you know using a fake ID and getting a SIM card so they can get your SMS messages. This is happening. Um, so, so those are some of the things from a security perspective that we really started to, to put in place. Yeah, the, the zero trust, if I can follow on to what you're saying, Michael, is uh, there's several facets of zero trust. And, and we've been engaged since 2004 at HP uh, in, in designing our hardware with zero trust principles. But most people, when they see that and most of the NIST documentation refers to identity management. And, mm -hmm. and so people think, well, gee, I'm doing multi-factor authentication. That's what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm okay. And the truth is most people doing multi-factor are doing two factors. That's not what multi-factor should drive for. Multi-factor means more than two to me. And, and there can be up to 10 or even more factors that you can attribute for identification. You know, are they coming in for the right IP address? Did the camera on the entranceway see them walk in the building? Well, maybe not the right uh, equation now, but you know, is the facial recognition on? The typing in print, people type with a specific rhythm that can be detected and fingerprinted. And is that part of your multi-factor to say that is who it's supposed to be? In, in the past, Michael mentioned the tokens. It was something you know, which is a password, and something you have, which could be a token or a phone or some physical product that Ping or Okta can, can relate to. In the future, it's gonna be a combination of many of these that give you a security probability that that is who you are, not a certainty, uh, but in today's security environment, being fairly benign, if you're 80% likely to be you or above, you're allowed in the network, but in a heightened tension when ransomware is rampant, and attacks are underway, uh, you might require 95%. And the security implications are, it's a time decay, like mm -hmm. a radioactive decay, that once validated by the camera, that you get 100% the minute you're validated, but that starts to decay off. And then when it hits 80%, you have to revalidate. You have to have another camera check. You have to type in a code, or you have to get something sent to your phone that you can put back in. And that starts to get to where you have trust that that individual is who they say they are. But zero trust also includes software, and it also mm -hmm. includes hardware. And those are different principles of zero trust apply, but it's a philosophy. And the philosophy applies across the board. Yeah, no, that's, that's very insightful. And, and I think um, it was very interesting, Mike, uh, you mentioned earlier, uh, it kind of put everything on its head uh, to some extent that, you know, you're trying to now make the experience of folks coming back to the office to be the same as they had it when they were remote, which was the opposite <laughs> before, because there were conversations where we were saying, well, how do we get the employees to have the same access and same experience at home like they did at work? So, so things are kind of, you know, gone uh, upside down here for, uh, for, 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 uh, for, the, for the future. Um, but, but I think where we're headed in, in, and where, you know, what it, what it seems to me is, is, is a bit of a hybrid world, right? In the sense that um, a couple of things that I, we pick up from the networking side of the world, right? Um, in order to move applications to the cloud and have it be accessible anywhere, anytime, any device, uh, it, it, the whole underlying network access mechanism has completely taken a, a, a beating, if you would, right? So the old MPLS networks, again, the secure legacy, you know, hairpinning through the data centers and back to get the access, all of that's gonna now distribute it out all the way to the different, you know, internet access points, which, you know, could be all the way from broadband, you know, branch location, um, to still certain applications and certain, you know, user types that would require, you know, um, either to be in the office or be in a very secure uh, access uh, 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 platform, um, such as a zero trust possibly, where, you know, you're, you're, you're now controlling who's accessing what, not just by the mere, you know, IP address or the network location, but from a very specific, you know, identity aware, uh, precise, uh, sort of a, 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 a zero trust uh, a framework. So, so having, Having said that, it sounds to me like, you know, there's going to be a bit of a hybrid 
uh, you know, emergence of, of, of how things kind of not only people work in remote and in work type of hybrid, but also the user profiles, right? Who's accessing the data? What are, so what are the types of data that they're accessing? Uh, it's quite possible, like I'm sitting here right now, I'm not using VPN at all, right? And because I'm using all the SaaS applications, I'm using, uh, you know, Microsoft Office and, 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 and um, Zoom and uh, Teams and whatever. Um, and then there's a, there's a lot of other SaaS applications maybe on the, you know, the ERP side as well, right? Uh, um, contact center uh, as, a, as an example. But, but there are individuals, and I know there are companies that I've spoken to where they've essentially mandated that every endpoint A be managed and B use VPN to access. So, so what, are, what are your thoughts in like how, how all of this is gonna shake? And, 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 and if I may add, how all of this sort of m- convergence of network and security as a service moving to the cloud as a way to kind of promote this, this hybrid uh, environment in the future, how's that gonna play out? So if, if you look at, let's start with the fact that everyone is now distributed, right? You've got the folks who are living on the West Coast who are moving anywhere but the West Coast. You've got folks that are in the Northeast that are moving out of the Northeast. You've got a lot of folks that are relocating as part of this whole um, you know, remote from the office experience. So if you make your users still connect all the way back to the data center to get to um, SaaS-based resources, which because SaaS resources are distributed you know, in, in different concentrations around the globe, then you're really hurting the end user experience and the performance, and you're making your users far less productive. So what we've done is by adopting more of a um, edge networking and edge compute mindset, we've moved a lot of those functions and a lot of those entry points to a number of different locations all around the globe so that when you're in the Northeast, you might hit something, um, you know, in the middle of the East Coast, or if you're you know, on, on the West Coast, you might hit something, you know, more towards the Southwest. So that this way you're on ramp to getting to the resources that are SaaS-based resources is a much, much shorter on ramp. The other thing that we've taken into account is the more you make users use VPN, the more VPN head-ends and, and sign-on points you're going to need, unless, again, everything is going to, you know, going to hairpin into where the VPN head end is and then back again. And again, really killing the end user experience. It's, it's almost like treating the users who are remote the same way you used to treat them when they were in a campus where campus had a big fat pipe into the data center and the data center is where you had your internet access and your big firewall that protected you. Well, your users have left the perimeter. If you only put your security inside a perimeter and believe using a VPN brings them secretly into the perimeter so they come back out through your secure wall, then you're, you're, you're hurting your end user experience and you're fooling yourself into a false sense of security that doesn't really exist. Yeah, I think Michael's right on in here. I, I have a little different ver- vision of what the cloud is. And, uh, and I'll try to explain it to you, but it comes from my background. I chair the Advanced Computing Roundtable for the U.S. Council on Competitiveness. And we're exposed to a lot of different concepts of the next generation internet, uh, which will be a quantum internet, very secure, uh, next generation computing, which will be a hybrid computing between your conventional computers today and quantum computers, kind of the way that a math coprocessor was in the early days of computing, offload the heavy math, to the coprocessor, which in the future will be a, a high uh, quantum computing. Uh, but the real problem that I see with the cloud is just a bunch of hardware. I mean, there, there, there's software that makes it work, but it's, but it's not really out in the ether space. It is physically located in a, lo- in a secure facility. And, uh, and the beauty is that you're able to scale. Scale fast up if you need more resources, scale down when you need less supposedly there's cost savings in doing that. Practically, you don't find them. And the reason is people start depending on the cloud and putting everything up there. And that meter just starts clicking on and on. And so what I'm advising companies 
is look at the on-prem cloud, one that you own and you control, and you don't pay by the minute charges for CPU use, that you actually own the CPU, invest in the hardware, and you'll find that you save money doing that. Now, you have to go case by case because not everybody's going to save money doing that. The small businesses may be better off in the public clouds, but the large entities can, can work. And we have some uh, outstanding hardware. And so I'm biased in this fact, uh, but uh, our data science uh, workstations uh, are just monster machines. You know, they're looking at 32 to 64 cores of Xenon cores that can run 328 gigabytes of RAM. Uh, it's just, it can solve almost any problem you have, but it can be the basis or the format of a on-premise cloud. Uh, it, it's something that you, you've got to consider the cost of your public cloud, the, the Azure, the Amazons, the IBMs that, that are, you know, very, very expensive in my opinion, but uh, you know, on the, on, if you're just taking a little bite, it doesn't seem that much, but if everybody in your company is taking a little bite 10 times a day, it starts to add up. And so, you know, here's one thing. And then, and then, as I said, cost is secondary to security. So you've got to look at security. If you can protect your on-premise cloud better than Amazon or Microsoft, and that's debatable. I, I don't know you know, what, how secure they really are because I don't have insights into their methods and methodologies. But if you could, uh, then go with the better security and worry about the cost secondary. I can't Man, think you're coming from a, a company. A, uh, sorry, sorry, Tommy. Uh, so, Tommy, there's Ashish here and Gaurav, if I can just go ahead and ask a question. Uh, just a follow up question. When, you, when you're talking about the cloud computation, is it also somewhere connected to the uh, to the EUC onboarding as well. So for example, you know, the sort of personas or the sort of business segments within your organization, you know, how that the entire thing is is defined, right? And and, and that's where you, the, you think the segmentation is happening internally as well, at how much workload has to go to which cloud? Is, uh, is that somewhere related, Tommy? It is related, no, it, it is. And when you bring in somebody new to the organization, uh, the speed that you get them up and running is, is important. You can do that on-prem. Uh, if you know how to do it, it, it certainly is almost uh, uh, instantaneous when you go to an Azure or, uh, or, or to an Amazon uh, section. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm concerned uh, not as much as bringing people on as getting them off uh, is when they leave the company, have an immediate termination of passwords and access and rights, uh, because that's where a lot of the hacking goes, is they're looking for people who just announced they left a company, and, and they're, right in, they're, they're right in the back door, pretending to be them, getting their privileges, and then trying to escalate privilege, which is uh, very adept at doing but you're, you're, you're exactly right. That's a, a, a very big concern is bringing people on and onboarding and expanding uh, the number of people in your network. I think Chad, Chad's Chad is going okay. to, I think Chad, Chad was next. Uh, Gene, if you can let him go yeah. first. No, I, I've got a little bit of a different perspective. I mean, coming from kind of a large financial and, you know, historically, a lot of the financials, you know, for regulatory and compliance reasons, didn't trust the public cloud and so therefore built up very big kind of private clouds on prem and that's largely where our applications are today i um you know i i kind of disagree with tommy here i just don't think if you gave me the slickest hardware in the world and subs it in i'd still waste money on private cloud and uh, the benefits that we do see from both the cost um, security and scalability perspective moving to an aws azure or google and uh you know integrating a lot of the um, access management that, you know, it feels like we continually have new teams being spun off on our own private clouds today, um, that those organizations are so inflated that it's not a hardware problem to me. It's a, how do you fundamentally change an organization as large as JP Morgan to, you know, embrace kind of a cloud first mindset and, um, you know, it's, it's a, it's, it's, it's a process problem. It's a people problem. 
Um, even kind of look at, you know, where budgets are being allocated. You know, it's how do you do that at scale? And I just don't see, uh, while I agree hybrid solution is the long-term mm-hmm. answer, it's not 100% public cloud. I completely agree with that. And a lot of for, for our highly confidential data concerns or um, some of the more protected uh, data, we're going to absolutely keep that on-prem. Uh, but if you manage compliance and entitlements and do your micro-segmentation appropriately, then I argue you can um, kind of achieve maximum benefits by moving as much as you can to the public cloud and then leaving only kind of your most um, HCV data and applications on-prem. And I think you come out with kind of a best in breed, but- Well, I, you see, I think, I think you're right on, Chad, because uh, I can see why JP Morgan would go that direction. I mean, it makes sense to me intuitively, but the key is you've done the analysis, you've done the homework, you've done the trade-offs looking at what if we do this or we do that, Here's the cost in this scenario. Here's the cost in that one. We think we're better off with this strategy. Most companies don't go through that. They, they, they take the path of least resistance. They take the easy way without analyzing the cost impacts or the budget impacts that have to be done. But thanks for bringing that out. Uh, my statement was more generic. You have to analyze each situation and company by company. Yeah, and I, I think I would I would uh, I would kind of you know um, echo the same sentiment, uh, Chad, towards the end, which is kind of what we experience as a service provider because we we face a lot of these you know uh, kind of conversations across multiple enterprises, and we're finding that hybrid is the is what people want to do. Uh, the question that kind of comes up a lot is 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 how do you manage that right? There's there's the um, there's the application migration, the application development, the access. There's the network component. There's a security component, and and there are there are ways in which that the cloud can handle the integrated network and security that just doesn't exist today because today it's very siloed. You know, and in, in specifically in in the in the on-premise environment, it's you know, very hardware driven and it's very kind of you know broken up into pieces. And there's 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 not there's not a whole lot of uh, you know. Um, management that you can do, of course there is, but it creates holes. Um, and so, from from our perspective, what we've noticed is is that you know a managed sort of a hybrid uh, service provider uh, type approach seems to be where things are headed. Um, and there's a lot of consolidation that needs to happen. There's a lot of movement that needs to happen. As I was saying earlier, I think what we're also finding is a lot of companies are are looking to migrate even the access uh, from you know the different offices, whether it's a branch office, a retail, it's a, uh, a you know a manufacturing facility. Uh, that that there are different access types they want in place, and there are certain places, like I said earlier, they may want to keep their own data centers and have a public you know cloud uh, application, a, a public cloud uh, instance, and and have those access mechanisms be completely different by user type. Right. Uh, so, so it's 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 very interesting. I don't think there's one good answer, except I think when I when I call it the next normal, I kind of feel like it's it's a, it's not the not the the uh, how do you rethink uh, you know the new normal or the next normal is how do you rethink the hybrid normal? But anyway, that's that's my my two cents here. Uh, Gene, you had a question or a comment or anybody? No, else? I'm fine. I think Chad addressed it. I, I was just thinking from a business standpoint. Many and and Tommy addressed it well. And Tommy, thank you for your service. We appreciate it. Um, from a business standpoint, when asking people to really kind of look back at the equipment side of it, it really removes a lot of the drivers to help reduce costs. The kind of cost that that moves the needle, right? Like things like total cost of ownership, upgrading equipment, end of life equipment. You now have to take into consideration service and support models. A lot of guys are skipping that whole process and saying, you know what? mitigate that risk and cost, shift it to someone else, let that be managed, it will handle all the content and data. And I wanted to kind of understand, how do you reconcile your perspective and view with a lot of those things that are driving enterprises today to try to move towards the cloud, right? The commercial aspects. Um, so so if I could just chime in there, you know, as far as the commercial aspects, it's important to understand, unless you can go into public cloud and adopt all and only cloud native solutions that your cloud provider provides for you, highly unlikely, 
then you still need to bring some of your existing software providers and existing um, solutions into public cloud, where a lot of those providers are moving towards a software subscription model or moving towards uh, an ELA uh, and user licensing type of model um, or, or you can eat type of model where, you know, it, it was, um, you know, from a physical network infrastructure perspective, the terms that strategic source and dreaded hearing was time for a true up where, you know, each vendor would show up and say, well, here's how many you say you have. Here's how many you really have. You owe us this number of millions of dollars, but don't worry, we'll give you something instead of those millions of dollars that you can use to continue this through a process growing. The same thing happens in public cloud, right? Now that we shouldn't you know, go into some delusion that because now it's software only because it's someone else's hardware that we're not gonna encounter the same thing from a software licensing perspective. Because um, we run now most of our functions as network you know, function virtualization. And we still go through the same process as we were going through physical devices, um, looking at, you know, the, the, the operational costs of that infrastructure. Yeah, one of, the, one of the things you wanna consider in either scenario for the cloud is your encryption. And encryption services, depending on which public or if you're doing it on premise, uh, the data protection through encryption is at risk today. And it's really at risk because of a guy named uh, Peter Shore, who was up at MIT as a mathematician and created an algorithm for finding very efficiently large prime numbers, which is the basis of encryption. And so Shore's algorithm kind of changed the tune and, uh, and really caused NIST to start researching the post-quantum encryption technologies. And they've gone from 70 some initial proposals, narrowed it down to 25 a couple of years ago. And with intent within the year or so, uh, they're gonna come up with the top three to five, which will be encryption for the future. And that is gonna be a big change in protection, a big change in the ability to make sure data uh, that was intended to be safe for a hundred years from a brute force act uh, may uh, very soon be safe only somewhere between 30 minutes and four hours. Post-quantum encryption will solve that and there's gonna be a need for a shift in those technologies and resources for protecting information. And that's data at rest and data in motion. Most of us think about data in motion as how can I send something from one end to another. Um, and, and quantum key distribution is going to be a factor. Those are processes in place today, mostly in place in the uh, electric or energy sector to protect SCADA devices and prevent them from being hacked uh, with anything other than a physical premise to collect key to key name from uh, right there at the spot. And even that is very difficult to do. So those are some things coming down the pike that you're gonna to have to evaluate and have to be ready for. And it's gonna be a cost factor to every business. Yeah, and I think, I think uh, so, so by the way, just uh, from a format perspective, guys, I think the conversation is going well. So we're gonna just keep everybody in the same room instead of breaking it up, uh, Dallas, if that's okay. Um, I, I, we've only got about another 15 minutes or so, right? Okay, so I just I just wanted to maybe ask a question off. Uh, I, I understand uh, was it was it Mike Williams? Uh, I don't know if he's still on uh, or Mark Williams. Sorry, um, from Borg Warner. Just trying to get your perspective from the manufacturing side. Um, interesting, interesting aspect from the manufacturing side. So I guess like everybody else, we sent everybody home and working from home, but. Um, we certainly, um, we've, well, I'll put it this, put it this way. Um, we had to react really quickly to employ everybody from working home. So thank God mm -hmm. virtualization of, of, of appliances. We were able to satisfy our VPN requirements, quick requirements mm -hmm. in a very short time. But since then we've actually implemented a SASE solution and, mm -hmm. and, um, 
And with that and the way people have been forced to work from home now and learn to adapt, um, we've taken on a whole new a whole new strategy about how we, I don't know if you want to say bring people back to work or bring people back to work, but, um, you know, we certainly have, um, have taken a new approach about telephony. You know, we've started our strategy before COVID was, you know, migrate to voice over IP and SIP. Now it's migrate to Microsoft Teams cloud and SIP and no more phones on desks. And, and you've learned all to you how to use headphones and microphones um, mm-hmm. and collaboration that certainly from that aspect, um, the polycom phones that you walked away from that had a dial pad are no longer valid anymore because we're not doing dial anymore. Right. Um, from, a, from a networking perspective um, with our SASE solution, we're, we're actually able to deliver back better performance. And I think Michael, you know, Michael hit on it. You know, we had six entry points. Now we have hundreds of entry points mm-hmm. and, um, and they're geosensing, right? So they're matching up gateways with people and delivering performance metrics back to the people that work at home. Um, the common pitfalls for us were, you know, working from home, hairpinning, um, sending everything in, sending everything out, that's gone. Um, I'll say that our, our silliest achievement that I will say to date is giving the ability for people to print locally at home. Because before we didn't employ split tunneling and the, <laughs> the overall overwhelming applause of people being able to do something as simple as printing is really quite funny. But from a manufacturing standpoint, um, we've been able to keep the operations running. Um, We certainly have to send people into the plants to work, but those people that don't need to go into the plants are able to um, work from home and support the plants, as well as um, functionally run our yeah, our consolidated ERP system, SAP. So from wherever in the world they need to. So for us, um, it's a good news story. I will definitely say from the way we used to support VPN um, service to how we're leveraging our SASE solution is, is really an amazing, an amazing change for our organization. And it just, I mean, you can go, right? You can just stay on that. And again, I think Michael hit on a couple of the topics. You can just stay on that and you can talk about, now you can offer safe split tunneling where you can do remote patching, remote imaging, um, really leverage the cloud um, to offload a lot of those services and leverage a lot of those services. I'll say the, out of this whole thing, the perhaps the one, pitfall in all of this is application rationalization is which we're going on now like and for those of you probably not too familiar with the manufacturing industry we've over the years you tend to utilize the custom code to run a particular operation that was built on a windows 7 or Windows NT server on your manufacturing floor that you've never been able to upgrade because it doesn't need to be upgraded or things like that. So those are the types of things that are probably the pitfalls of it is how do you start to transform some of those applications and rationalize them so that they'll run from the edge or from a hybrid edge. But so it's been a good news story for us so far. So yeah, sounds sounds like it. Sounds like it. So your your SASE solution then uh, so you're you're pretty much all in the cloud, and because uh, SASE by definition kind of implies that you you've you moved uh, you've integrated network and security, and you're using a, a service provider for it, or are you yeah. doing it? No, right. we're using we're use Prisma Palo Alto solution, but not, not the South Palo Alto. But um, you know, the, if I was I've had this discussion this morning, mm-hmm. but we we're transforming all of our sites to use cloud firewall and we're transforming all you know we've transformed all of our users to use vpn cloud firewall and if you think about that 
all of our traffic is seen through a single hinge point where we can manage malware, um, inline inspection, uh, decrypt, decrypt traffic, inline DLP. I mean, we're seeing all the traffic whether you're coming from our factories or coming from our end, end users who are at home. So it's a, I'll say it's a wonderful experience to be able to have that consolidated view into our data lake as well. So there's a lot of real good opportunities that we've leveraged out of that space. I mean, just take maybe another 30 seconds on this. How, how long did it take you to do all that? Um, you know, the, um, the implementation was relatively straightforward. Um, the adoption, good Lord, the adoption is, was, was really pretty much straightforward. I mean, we, mm-hmm. um, you know, it's a new client and we pushed new, the new clients out with the profile in it. And really it's the nice thing. Like I say, the nice thing about it is, is that it, the client geosenses, so it knows where your closest gateway is, so it's able to distribute you appropriately, and it takes the it takes the work out of selecting the end the, the location which you're going to enter in for our sites. Um, it's it's literally a, a tunnel, right? So you're creating a tunnel between your cloud firewall and your site, and it's an onboard. It's I won't say it's simple work, but um, it's pretty much it's pretty simple work. Um, to get that in place. It's a lot, we have, you know, a little over a hundred locations. It's a lot easier than distributing a hundred firewalls. Mm, right, right. Interesting. Well, thank you. Thank you for uh, sharing your experience. Mm-hmm. Um, any, anybody else, any, any questions? We've got about, uh, we've got a few minutes left still. Or, or comment? I guess the question, how do you guys see um, software-defined perimeter playing into the equation in the future. I mean, while we absolutely agree it's kind of zero trust is the way to go, and in a hybrid world, there is no physical perimeter. You know, managing thousands of VPNs up and down is not scalable or cost-effective. And, you know, verifying biometric data on a regular basis is too not transparent for our users. So what's kind of the right answer in terms of um, security yet not having kind of the inherent latency or um, not a great customer experience? So uh, I'll say um, proper certificate management has been key for us so that we can um, do system and platform validation without having to force the end user to provide anything at all before providing them access. So getting you to the right on-ramp, um, but not letting you in the door, um, validating that your machine should have access to the, the doorway itself. So we use uh, you know, a web-based um, proxy VPN, which is completely transparent to the end users and it's only when they only start to go to resources themselves that things like MFA or authentication mechanisms might kick in. And as long as the connectivity remains stable um, and it's you know, certificate based, and as long as the user remains connected to the environment, um, one of the things that this creates is the ability to keep them always on, right? So the idea of you know, always on zero trust security, private VPN means in theory, as long as your end user's connectivity doesn't um, have a degree of instability, they're in and they're on. And it's not like the old, you know, um, Nortel VPN, you know, or um, or even the, the NetScreen or whatever VPN you used to use where, you know, every eight hours, you'd have to go find your token and you'd always be in the middle of typing something or doing something on a server that's in your data center, right? I mean, now if you're using Office 365, then it doesn't matter if you're VPNed in anyway, because you're authenticated through, you know, Federation in a, and maybe using even Azure AD, or if you're using, um, you know, Workday or some other SaaS-based application, it makes a lot of those things 
just as consistent from end user perspective and just as secure as when they were inside the wall. But now because a lot of that is application based, um, it's not the, you know, the tuple, you know, source destination IPs and ports, which, you know, hackers have for many years known how to work around those things by just rewriting information inside the packet. So doing um, much more intelligent security protection, um, much more, you know, uh, you know, robot, I'm missing the right word, but, but making it a lot easier user experience can also increase the security when you need them to, to do something that requires authentication or enforcement. And a lot, a lot of the attacks are coming in at the BIOS level before the operating system even initiates, and then they own you. And so you have to protect the BIOS first, and we have some methods to do that, and some uh, trusted control modules that, you know, are checking every second or less is the BIOS that's in a cryptographically signed chip that should be there, the same BIOS that's in memory that should be operating, or somebody tampered with it. So the resiliency issue, if you are attacked and if it is successful, how long will it last? And if it's less than a second, no real harm can be done. Uh, if it's weeks, days, or in some cases, like the US Navy had attacked persistent in the network that was resilient for over a year embedded in the systems, uh, that can be very problematic. Uh, we're looking at some new technologies that uh, uh, would be a tamper-proof capability that if uh, you have hardware and somebody tries to manipulate it, they, they go in, maybe a uh, case would be that they uh, went into uh, the halls of Congress and stole a couple of computers and uh, tried to tamper with them and then, you know, had them found. So they go back to the owner, you know, uh, so they could read everything going through the speaker's uh, chambers. Uh, well, there, there's a way to know if, your machines have been tampered with. One way they were looking at is cryptographically signing every logic bearing chip and hashing those numbers, magging the hash up so the computer will not boot if a chip has been replaced or added. And, uh, and so that way you can assign that machine to an individual or to a position and protect your network by you don't get access to the network if we don't have the cryptographically signed machine that we've authorized to be on this, this program. Uh, another way, uh, you mentioned Starbucks earlier, uh, Gerard, is you know working at your local Starbucks instead of at home, and a lot of people do that. Uh, but if you're going to work for Starbucks, you probably don't want to be on the Starbucks network. You don't want to just join in to the unsecure open network where uh, there are people that can jump right in and read everything you're doing. Um, and so to do that, we have capability in most of our uh, modern platforms uh, to put a cellular SIM card in your computer and work off a cellular connection, which is an order of magnitude more secure than your uh, local McDonald's or Starbucks or, or a hotspot that you can pick up otherwise. So, uh, but identifying machines to people, to cell phones, to, you know, there, there's a lot of techniques out there that would help you uh, feel more certain that the people on your network are the people are authorized to be. Appreciate that. <clears throat> We're pretty much out of time. Maybe time for one more question or comment. <clears throat> Anyone? I see a lot of banks on the on the call here. Hey, well, I, I will note that the, the financial industry is the most secure industry that I found, and I think that's generally accepted, that the, the risk-reward uh, ratio uh, is, is such that uh, it, they've got to spend the time and effort to solidify uh, their, uh, their data and solidify the financial records. Uh, so uh, because of that and having known that, they've been on the top end, the bleeding edge of all T IT innovations in security. And, uh, and, you know, that's a good place to start if you're starting a business and want to look to security, look to the financial industry. 
Awesome. <clears throat> Great. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I guess um, I guess we bring it uh, bring it to a close here. Unless uh, one last call uh, for anyone. If not, I think um, this was this was uh, very insightful. I really really appreciate Tommy, Michael, everybody else who participated. Your comments. Um, <clears throat> I uh, one one thought I'm taking away from is is uh, security first, and then uh, then cost performance and schedule. And uh, the next thing I'm going to go read is this uh, quantum internet. Uh, <laughs> I want to know what that's all about. <laughs> well, we're, uh, it's a little early to give you all the details, but uh, there was some great testing done up at the University of Chicago last year. Uh, there's some work at Southern Methodist University that is going to get us a uh, uh, quantum true random number generator because right now our encryptions do not use true random number generators or pseudo random number generators. So you get much better encryption that way. Uh, your ability to create single photons and to use photons in the polarity of photons is it either a zero or one can give you encryption methodologies to get your key distribution right. And, uh, and so it doesn't have anything to do with a quantum computer, mm. but it's using quantum techniques to create a secure internet that's designed to be secure from the start, unlike the internet we're on the now, Right. It was designed to be completely open. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so uh, there, there are a couple of locations uh, where the Department of Energy is thinking of investing heavily uh, to demonstrate the capability and security that could be brought in the next generation internet. And, uh, you know, I'm just happy to be watching from the sidelines. But no, that's very interesting. It's very interesting. It's yeah, we, we, we used to, uh, you know, as, as, as one of the conversations with our customers used to say, well, the, the internet is not created equal. Yeah. And that was one of the, you know, sort of uh, um, uh, distinguish or differentiating points that we would bring to the table because, you know, while you can have different, you know, access types or, or what have you, we did also develop certain, you know, uh, uh, this is not a sales pitch, by the way, I'm just kind of mentioning that, <laughs> that very, very, uh, interesting in that sense that we did kind of come up with an internet which would mimic or at least uh, replicate the same level of performance and security as the MPLS um, among and and have the ability to sort of manage all of the different uh, you know uh, internet types across the different sites. But anyway, this was very interesting. Um, thank you uh, very much, Odalis. Uh, back to you. Thank you. Thanks to Tata Communications for sponsoring today's event, Gara for moderating, and Michael and Tommy for being our panelists. And to all of our registrants for joining today, I hope to see you guys all at a future event. Uh, and let's connect on LinkedIn after this. I hope you all have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, you Thanks too. Everybody. Thank you, Mike. Thank, Thank you, you, Tommy. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Appreciate Thank you. it. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.